This podcast is brought to you by Big World Tours, a company that I'm setting up in partnership with a dear friend of mine, which is designed to allow you to travel and dive into your passions and interests through our niche history tours. Our first tour will be England at the end of April 2016 for nine days, and it's all about the English choral experience and tradition. We're focusing on the musical history of the English choral tradition, visiting and hearing music in such places as King's College, Cambridge, Ely Cathedral, Bath and Winchester and Salisbury Cathedrals. It's going to be an amazing trip. I'm so excited. We're capping it at only 12 people, so it's going to be really intimate. Um, We're all going to sing together on the bus. It's going to be amazing. See awesome history, and uh, and I'm hosting it with my dear friend. Um, So to learn more, go to www.bigworld.com. Again, that's www.bigworld, all one word, word, bigworld.com. Dot com. Big World, travel your passions. Hello and welcome to the Renaissance English History Podcast. I'm your host, Heather Tusco. I've been talking a lot in previous episodes about the things that were swirling around Mary, Queen of Scots, like the Catholic experience in England, the life of Francis of Walsingham, who rose to prominence through his entrapment of her. So she really deserves an episode of her own. But before I get started, just a reminder that if you like this podcast, please rate it in whatever service you use to listen to it, whether it's iTunes or Stitcher or whatever else. And also remember that at englandcast.com, there are continually updated resources like reading lists, listening lists for music, and buttons to donate to the Patreon page if you are so inclined to support this podcast, either by giving a one-time tip via PayPal or by making a regular subscription contribution. And both are incredibly appreciated. So let's get started. Mary Stewart was born into family drama in 1542. The poor thing, she really never had much of a chance to have a normal life at all. And it's important to realize that she was Henry VII's great-granddaughter. And as far as the Catholics in England were concerned, Elizabeth, Queen Elizabeth, was a bastard because Queen Catherine of Aragon was still alive when Anne Boleyn had Elizabeth. So we're going into England here for a second. So when Anne Boleyn had Elizabeth, Catherine of Aragon was still alive. And so as far as the Catholics were concerned in England, um, Elizabeth was a bastard born out of bigamy. And so she was, so sadly, Mary was always going to be this figurehead for Catholic rebellion, no matter what she did. Um, Mary was the closest person to the throne who was a Catholic, who was clearly legitimate. There was no question about her legitimacy, even from Catholics. Um, And she was just put in this position from the time of her birth, that she was really always going to be a figurehead for any kind of rebellion. So... She also grew up believing that she had a really good claim to the English throne and that she could easily press that claim. She grew up at the French court, which I'll talk about, and she grew up just knowing that she was rightly, uh, could potentially be the Queen of England and displaying the English arms, for example. So it it really got quite dramatic. Um, And all of that didn't help her to ingratiate herself with Queen Elizabeth once it became clear that Elizabeth's hold on the throne was secure. So from the time Mary was born, she was caught up in these dynastic struggles of her mother's French family. So her mother was French. And in November 1542, right when Mary was born, King James V of Scotland was dying. And his heart was really broken by his army's defeat by the English at Solway Moss. And he was told that Mary of Guise, his French wife, had given birth to a daughter, Mary. And when he received the news of Mary's birth, he apparently said, Woe is me, my dynasty came with a lass, it will go with a lass. Only he probably said it in a Scottish accent, which I'm not going to try to do. So what that meant was his ancestor, Robert II, had become the King of Scots 
close to 200 years before in 1371 through his mother's line. And so he, James V, believed that the lineage had ended with his daughter's birth because he could never contemplate the fact that his grandson would rule both Scotland and his enemy, England. So he was really upset because he thought his dynasty was going to end because he had a daughter. So he died within a week of Mary's birth. And before she was even a year old, she was crowned Queen of Scots. The Scottish nobility agreed that she should marry Henry VIII's son, Edward, because she was still so young, they were so vulnerable, it seemed like a good match. But they actually, and they actually signed a treaty. And as soon as the treaty was finalized, the Catholics who favored the French on her mother's side took her to Stirling Castle, and Henry VIII had this huge fury um, because they were breaking the treaty, they weren't going to go ahead with the marriage, they were going to look to France. Um, they broke the treaty and they decided that Mary, Queen of Scots, needed to go back into France and was should marry there. So Henry wasn't happy. He ordered a series of raids into Scotland, which are actually still known as the Rough Wooing. And the English set fire to the Abbey of Holyrood House, where James V was buried. They burned crops in the Tweed Valley and they set fire to several abbeys on the border. And Scotland still went ahead with the French plan. Mary left her mother and she sailed to France in 1548. She was brought up at the French court. Even though she was without her mother, she did have a lot of friends at court um, and relatives of her mother and four of her best friends, who were all called Mary, who stayed with her for life, the four Marys they were called. She grew up at the court studying with the other royal children in the nursery. She was given precedence over the king's own daughter because she was an anointed queen on her own and she was going to be marrying his son. And the king became so fond of um, of Mary and he used to say that the little queen of Scots is the most perfect child I've ever seen. And also while she was in France, Mary's maternal grandmother Antoinette de Guise wrote to her daughter, Mary's mother, in Scotland, saying that Mary was very pretty, graceful, and self-assured. So after about 10 years at the French court, she married the Dauphin Francis in 1558. And this was also the year that Mary Tudor passed away in England. So Mary, Queen of Scots, French family, encouraged her to assume the royal arms of England. And in the eyes of most of Catholic Europe, Mary was the next heir to the English throne, like I said, given that Elizabeth was considered illegitimate. And it was this central belief that would just reverberate throughout Mary's life. Um, Queen Elizabeth would never feel fully safe while her Catholic relative was alive and posted such a threat to pose such a threat to her rule. But she was inclined to forgive, and after being persuaded that it was more Mary's family that had this ambition for her to be queen rather than anything Mary wanted for herself, it seemed like the two could be friends and started some some negotiations uh, to try to have a friendly relationship. Mary had always been exceedingly trusting of her family and the people who advised her. And as proof of this, when she was in France, she actually sent 35 sheets of blank pages with her signature back to her mother, who was acting as regent. And it was just to be used how she saw fit. So she trusted her mother with her signature and said, here, mom, (laughs) do whatever you want in my name. You know, she could put whatever kinds of proclamations she wanted there. Um, And, and so she, that was how much she kind of trusted in people. Um, She was really beautiful. She was really precocious. She was intelligent, but, One of her main faults was the level of trust that she put in those around her who didn't always have her best interests at heart. They were more interested in themselves than her. So King Henri II died in 1559. His son, the Dauphin, became King Francis. So Mary is now both the Queen of Scotland and the Queen of France. But Francis dies young in 1560, and Mary's life is turned upside down. After Mary Tudor had died and Elizabeth had become the Queen of England, The Protestants came back from exile, including John Knox, who went back to Scotland. And the Scots really wanted to reach a peace with Elizabeth. That was the main kind of concern of many of them. And the entire country officially became Protestant, in part thanks to the return of the former of the reformers. And also Mary's mother, who had been acting as regent, had died during this time as well. So there was room for the Protestants to come in. 
and the country became became Protestant. So Mary was Roman Catholic, but she had been assured by the nobles that she could come back and she would be able to worship in peace. And so she went back to Scotland after over a decade away to a country that was very, very different in religion than the one she had left. And she got back to Edinburgh in August of 1561. So at first, she ruled pretty successfully with moderation. She was advised by Lord James and William Maitland of Lovington. And similarly to Elizabeth, she didn't want to push people to worship in her Catholic manner. She was mindful of the religious wars that were erupting all over Europe, um, as well as Mary Tudor's reputation as Bloody Mary that was you know, kind of taking off during this time, thanks to John Knox and, and some others. Um, So she promoted Protestants and Catholics in her administration, and she gave money equally to Protestant churches. Well, not equally. She still gave more to Catholics, but she did give money to to Protestant churches. And she also tried to get a grip on the notoriously difficult to rule Scottish nobles who were prone to clan warfare, which made her really popular with the common people, but not so much the nobility. So though she was a Catholic, she became friends with one of the most learned Protestants of the time, George Buchanan. She also had peaceful relations with France and Spain and England. In 1566, though, she discovered that the English ambassador was spying, and so she ordered him out of the kingdom. And her peace with France and Spain was actually kept without a treaty, even though a treaty may have given Scotland some measure of protection against England, but she was really conscious of the fact that any treaty could also involve her subjects in an unpopular war that they may not have supported. And so her main aim during this time, like really the the main goal was to keep Scotland prosperous. And she did her best to keep the peace and to keep out of the growing tensions between England and Spain and France. She tried several times to meet with her counterpart in England, Queen Elizabeth. She sent her a portrait and asked for Elizabeth's portrait back. Um, she, there were lots of letters sent back and forth. There was actually a meeting that was supposed to happen, and it didn't. Um, and the reason it didn't was because William Cecil was fearful of a Catholic plot. So he was Elizabeth's kind of chief advisor, and he was really afraid of the Catholics and he managed to keep any kind of meeting from happening. And events in France where the Huguenots were being killed by Mary's relatives also frightened him into almost a a paranoia of having Elizabeth name Mary as her heir and meet with her in person. So Mary decided that marrying again was of paramount importance to keeping control of her country. However, her second, her Marriage, her second marriage in 1565 to her second cousin, Henry Lord Darnley, also a great grandson of Henry VII, initiated a tragic series of events that was made worse thanks to the factionalism within the Scottish nobility that I talked about before. Darnley was a really weak and unstable man. But on paper, the match made sense because he was directly descended from Henry VII as well. And that made Mary's own claim to the English throne that much stronger. Um, He was also raised Protestant and in England. So it seemed like, like it was a good match. But he was just spoiled rotten. And he was just really angry that Mary didn't make him a co monarch. He acted like a little brat and he let himself be used by Mary's enemies. One example of this, which is the most famous, is that when she was six months pregnant in March of 1566, Darnley was part of a group of Scottish nobles who broke into her room at Holyrood Palace and dragged her secretary into another room and stabbed him to death. And they said that he had too much influence over her foreign policy. But the thinking, and Mary certainly thought this, was that they meant for her to have a miscarriage and potentially die in childbirth from being so upset at watching this take place. I mean, she's like six months pregnant and they stabbed this guy like right in front of her. So she really believed that Darnley wanted to kill her. Then the nobles kept Mary as a prisoner. And as she entered the later stages of her pregnancy, she was desperate to escape. And she was very, very charming. She somehow brought Darnley back around to her side. They escaped together. And then three months later, the future James VI of Scotland was born. 
And it seemed like it was a, a happy time. She was still quite young and healthy after the birth, and she now had an heir. And this was really the height of her reign. Um, in December 1566, James was baptized in the Chapel Royal of Stirling Castle, and Mary was like once this fragile last hope of the Stuart dynasty. Um, she was still only 23 years old and had fulfilled a monarch's great greatest duty, really providing a healthy son and heir. So, of course, Queen Elizabeth, nine years older and unmarried, kind of by choice at this point, would have been watching with interest because she also knew that Mary's son would eventually be her heir as well if she didn't get married and have children. But James's birth only provided a brief respite. The nobles who had plotted with Darnley now felt that he had betrayed them. After all, they had captured the queen and her potential heir and murdered her dear friend and were in a position to pretty much demand anything. But Darnley's decision to help Mary escape infuriated them. And so in February of 1567, they blew up Darnley's house and his body was found in the garden. Many nobles were implicated, most particularly James Hepburn, the Earl of Bothwell, and he met with Mary about six miles outside of Edinburgh. He had 600 men with him and asked to escort Mary to his castle. And he told her she was in danger if she went to Edinburgh. And she was really confused by this point. It seemed like the nobles were back and forth and back and forth. And at that point, she thought that being with him would would solve the problem, would stop the bloodshed. And so she followed his his suggestions. Bothwell had previously been considered as a potential husband for Mary, but she had refused the proposal then, preferring to marry Darnley, and now she was in a really bad situation with her infant son to think about. So she consented to wed Bothwell, hoping that this would finally stabilize the country. And also he showed Mary an agreement that the nobles had signed that indicated that they were prepared to accept him as their overlord. So in May of 1567, they wed, and Mary wrote to foreign court saying that it was the right decision for her country. But the nobles were still not to be trusted. Now they were angry for the power that her new husband had over them. And so just a month after the marriage, rebel forces met Mary's, and the nobles demanded that Mary abandon Bothwell, whom they had earlier ordered her to wed. So they were really acting quite crazy. She refused and she reminded them of their earlier order and to avoid the bloodshed of battle, she turned herself over and the rebels took her to Edinburgh while Bothwell struggled to rally troops of his own. So Mary was taken to Loch Leven Castle and held prisoner, fearing for her own life, and she became really, really ill. She was forced to sign a document abdicating the crown in favor of the toddler, her son James, and at the end of that month, in July 1567, James was crowned king, and James Stuart, the Earl of Moray, Mary's half-brother um, by one of the king's mistresses, so he was a bastard, um, her half-brother became regent. And he uh, wasted no time in stealing her son and her jewels, and... Scottish history actually reveals that all of these nobles came to a really bad end. Moray was murdered just three years later. The next regents were also killed. And James, King James, her son, had one of the traitors executed in 1580 when he was still just a teenager. So Mary's cause was aided in 1568 when John Hay, before his execution, made a statement from the scaffold that told how the nobles had murdered Darnley. Um, before this, the nobles had attempted to make people believe that Mary was responsible. And so now she was able to win back some sympathy and some friends. And one of the people who were keeping her at Loch Leven helped her to escape. And after 10 months of captivity, she was free to come back and fight for her throne. She, she was advised to not leave the country, and she didn't listen. She was determined to go south and to ask Elizabeth for support. She felt sure that she, she really just felt sure that her fellow queen, being a queen, 
would want to help her. And given the fact that they were cousins and Mary was still her heir, she was just certain that Elizabeth was going to help her. And it didn't really work out that way, sadly. So she sailed to England in mid-May of 1568. She arrived in Workington, Cumbria, and Elizabeth was really in a quandary at this point because all along she had been stirring up some drama in Scotland, pitting the nobles against Mary, creating chaos in the north. Because the main reason was that if if Mary was busy with these internal issues, she would have had fewer resources to try and press any kind of claim in England. And at the same time, Elizabeth was nothing if not Henry VIII's daughter, and her support for monarchy in general was, was really firm. So she didn't know what to do here, whether she should help Mary or not help Mary. She appointed a commission to investigate what was going on. They met throughout 1568 and 1569, And in 1569, everyone who was part of this commission decided that Mary was not guilty of any kind of conspiracy and Elizabeth had nothing to fear from her. But sadly for Mary, that same year, the conservative Catholic nobles in England backed an idea that Mary should wed the Duke of Norfolk, Thomas Howard. So he was Elizabeth's second cousin, and he also had a claim to the English throne, And he was decidedly Catholic-leaning. And this would have been another really threatening match for Elizabeth, so she put Howard in the tower. And when he was released, though, he really stupidly got involved in another plot to help, help Spain invade England and bring the Catholic faith back to the island. And so then he was arrested, or he, yeah, he was executed in 1572 for treason. So again, there's just all this stuff swirling around that comes back to Mary. Not necessarily her fault, um, but she just didn't seem to have the kind of acumen to, to get through it unscathed and not being part of it. So at that point, Elizabeth also effectively put Mary under house arrest, which is how the situation would stay for the next decade and a half, because Elizabeth just didn't know what to do with her, but she knew she couldn't have her just running around loose. So Mary was moved from house to house, prison to prison. Eventually, she was about 70 miles northwest of London. She was as close to Elizabeth as she ever came. And, of course, Mary plotted from the very beginning to escape. You can't blame her. She's an anointed sovereign being held against her will. So she felt really justified in, in plotting to escape. But as the years passed, the plots grew more and more threatening to Elizabeth And it seemed like the only way for the issues around Mary to be resolved was for her to be executed. As long as she lived, she was going to be the focus of plots and attempts to take Elizabeth's life. So in October of 1586, so she's now been in England for over a decade and a half. Um, She's put on trial for plotting to kill Elizabeth and claim the English throne. Elizabeth's last letter to Mary was delivered at the start of the trial, and it said, quote, You have, in various ways and manners, attempted to take my life and to bring my kingdom to destruction by bloodshed. I have never proceeded so harshly against you, but have, on the contrary, protected and maintained you like myself. These treasons will be proved to you and all made manifest. Yet it is my will that you answer the nobles and peers of the kingdom as if I myself were present. I therefore require charge and command you that you make an answer, for I have been well informed of your arrogance. Act plainly and without reserve, and you will sooner be able to obtain favor of me. Elizabeth. So it's not like it was already decided what the outcome was going to be or anything, right? <clears throat> that was sarcasm. So Mary defended herself well, though she wasn't allowed to have any kind of friends or supporters at her trial, and the verdict had been decided before the trial even started. Mary admitted her desire to escape, but she said, I have not procured or encouraged any hurt against Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth. And she appealed for mercy, mentioning her own reputation for tolerance and kindness. She said, my subjects now complain that they were never so well off as under my government. But she also accepted the inevitable. And when the verdict was read to her, she said, I do not fear to die in a good cause. The trial just lasted for two days. 
But And it was over in mid-October of 1586, but it wasn't until the 7th of February 1587, so what, three, four, four months later, that she was told she was going to be executed the next morning. She asked for her chaplain, and it was refused. That request was refused. And the Earl of Kent apparently told her, your life would be the death of our religion. Your death would be its life. So also after she was executed, by orders of the English government, all of her possessions were burned so that the Catholics wouldn't save anything that was linked to her as a relic of a Catholic martyr. Because at that time, it was quite popular when, when priests were executed, people would stand around underneath and, and take things like if they had any kind of jewels or if they had anything that, that hadn't burned, even body parts that had survived, um, people would take them and they would be relics then um, and they would be sold to, to prominent Catholics. So they didn't want that to happen to Mary. So all of her possessions were completely burned. So the death sentence had been signed by Elizabeth, who later argued that her secretary Davison had deceived her as to its contents when, and she would not have signed it otherwise. So there's still this whole debate about whether Elizabeth actually meant to um, execute Mary, Queen of Scots, or not, and if this was just Elizabeth pretending she had been ignorant so that she could blame somebody else and not be held responsible for the death of uh, a fellow sovereign. So, um, yeah, it, it's kind of been this debate throughout the centuries. So she wrote a letter to Mary's son James about the execution, it was written on the 14th of February, so about a week later, and it claims her ignorance. She wrote, My dear brother, I would you knew, though not felt, the extreme dolor that overwhelms my mind for that miserable accident which, far contrary to my meeting, meaning, hath befallen. I have now sent this kinsman of mine, whom ere now it hath pleased you to favor, to instruct you truly of that which is too irksome for my pen to tell you. I beseech you that as God and many more know how innocent I am in this case, so you will believe me, that if I had bid aught, I would have bid by it. I am not so base-minded that fear of any living creature or prince should make me afraid to do that were just, or done to deny the same. I am not of so base a lineage, nor carry so vile a mind, but as not to disguise fits not a king, so will I never dissemble my actions, but cause them to show even as I meant them. Thus assuring yourself of me, that as I know this was deserved, yet if I had meant it, I never would lay it on another's shoulders. No more will I not damnify myself that I had thought it not. The circumstance it may please you to have of this bearer, and for your part think you have not in the world a more loving kinswoman, nor a more dear friend than myself, nor any that will watch more carefully to preserve you and your estate, and who shall otherwise persuade you judge them more partial to others than you. And thus in haste I leave to trouble you, beseeching God to send you a long reign, your most assured loving sister and cousin, Elizabeth R. So that was the letter she wrote to Mary's son, James claiming that it was all done against her will. Um, a year later, the Catholic Philip V of Spain invaded England with the famous Spanish Armada. And some people said that, of, that it was actually kind of urged on by Mary's execution. Stories of her martyrdom began to spread. And when she was executed, she actually wore completely red. So a completely red outfit which was the Catholic color for martyrdom. So kind of stories spread throughout Europe of, of what had happened. And um, this legend of her started to grow, which, which still to some extent is today, this, this Catholic martyr that Elizabeth had put to death. Um, 16 years later, Mary's son James became the King of England and Scotland. And in 1612, he moved her body to Westminster Abbey from Peterborough he constructed a magnificent tomb, which rivaled Elizabeth I's. So it was just, her life was just so tragic. It just, I don't really know that there could have been any other way for her. And I'm curious what anybody listening to this thinks. It seems like there were some things that were within her power, like not trusting people 
as much as she did, not trusting that Elizabeth was going to take care of her. But there were other things that were just completely beyond her control, like these nobles in Scotland that just weren't willing to listen to her and, and weren't willing to stop fighting and people dying on her. Um, that wasn't really something she could control. And also um, the fact that she was Elizabeth's heir and she was a Catholic just doesn't seem like there was anything. I suppose if she would have converted to Protestantism, maybe that would have helped her. But she just seems to be such a tragic personality. She's really interesting. So that's it for this week. And the book recommendation is Queen of Scots by John Guy. I'll put a link up on the website and the Facebook page, which is respectively http colon slash slash englandcast.com e-n-g-l-a-n-d-c-a-s-t englandcast.com you can also go to facebook.com slash englandcast and you can contact me send me show ideas or just send me nice things you can also check out my blog dedicated to inspiring excitement and passion about history travel and the humanities at curatory.com that's k-u-r-a-t-o-r-y curatory.com it stands for curated curiosity only with a k because i'm clever like that clever with a k (laughs) sorry i just made myself laugh (laughs) i've also started doing regular quick segments on different aspects of tudor history on youtube and it's called the tudor minute there's nothing that's more than five minutes long And sometimes Hannah makes an appearance. Actually, often Hannah makes an appearance because I usually do them when I'm with Hannah. So there's a link on the blog and the Facebook page. And also, many of you send me notes saying that you're getting anxious for me to do more with Elizabeth's time period. So over the next little bit, my next episodes are going to start looking at her life and times. I'm going to do something on trade here soon, Um, looking at Cecil. And yeah, I've got some plans for for other things to do. I kind of went on an early Tudor, sort of late medieval kick there for a while, but uh, I'm starting to move on. So thanks.